Hello, my name is Saurabh Sangvi, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and I'm also the head of the ticketing analytics panel. And we have a great group of panelists. Starting on my right, we have Cole Gagahagen, Danielle Majed um, from StubHub, and StubHub is also sponsoring this panel. We have Chris Granger from the NBA, Shira Springer, who's the moderator of this panel and also from Boston Globe, David uh, Cable from the San Jose Earthquakes, and Bill Chafin from the Kansas City Chiefs. The panel will go until 4.40, and we'll be having a 10-minute Q&A. The Q&A will be via Twitter, and uh, so just the reminder is start your questions with a Q and include hashtags SSAC13 and hashtag 210. All right, with that, Shira, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. I think there's a lot of new and exciting developments in the field of ticketing and ticketing analytics, and I hope we can get to a fair number of them uh, in this panel. For starters, I know there's been a lot of discussion in the secondary market um, already today, but I, I'd like to go there first because there's an interesting and new partnership between Ticketmaster and the NBA, nbatickets.com, where it allows fans to look at both the primary and secondary market in one interactive map. And it might be the way, the future, um, for ticketing. So Chris, if you could start us off and talk about nbatickets.com, and then we'll have Cole join in and give us the Ticketmaster perspective. Sure, sure. thank you. And, and again, thank you to MIT for putting this together, and thank you guys for coming. Um, we're really excited about our partnership with Ticketmaster. Again, it's called nbatickets.com, and the, the concept from the fan standpoint is to provide fans with all ticketing options in one place. So whether you're looking for any particular team, any type of ticket, whether it's a full season ticket, a group ticket, a partial plan, um, buying a ticket directly from the team or buying it directly from a fan. It's the one place in sports you can go to find all the tickets um, literally in one place. And the issue that you're speaking about is we're going to get to a point where um, Ticketmaster will build for our teams a seat map where you'll be able to pick your exact seat um, and you'll see all the primary tickets available for sale and all the secondary tickets available for sale <coughs> at the same place at the same time, which we think is really cool. and. Um, Certainly, our fans will enjoy the, um, the breadth of inventory that will be available to them at different price codes um, for different games. It'll be really neat. Yeah, so I mean, we just to add a little bit of that, that's probably about as, about as good a synopsis that, that uh, I, I, I could offer. I, I, you know, from our perspective, from, from Ticketmaster's perspective, we, um, we kind of feel like it's, it's time to stop lying to the fans, right? When the fans show up, everybody in this room, hopefully, presumably, is a fan. Uh, so when you show up and you buy tickets, and if you do so in the primary market, whether you come through a team site or you come through Ticketmaster or you go through the NBA, and you show up and you're, and you're greeted with a seating map, um, most of the time we're not actually showing you what in reality is out there to buy. We're showing what's still available in the primary market, but we're not showing what's available in the secondary market. <laughs> and as we're sort of fond of saying, and, and, um, and, and our CEO has said on a number of occasions recently, we don't think, and I don't think you guys I think you guys are this way as well. We don't think that fans wake up in the morning and say, I want to go buy a primary ticket or I want to go buy a secondary <laughs> ticket. We think the fans wake up and say, I want to go buy a ticket to go see the Warriors play if, if my buddies over there have done, the Brandon's done his job at getting them to come check out the site. But they wake up and say, I want to wake up, I want to go see a, a Warriors game. They don't say, I want to go buy a ticket in the primary or secondary market. So it's our job, and, and when Chris and I and some others started thinking about this about a year and a half ago, we said, how do we stop lying to that fan? And when they do show up and say, I want to buy our Warriors ticket, um, say, we're going to show you as much as we possibly can about the Warriors inventory that's out there. I would um, say we were lying to the fans. Yeah, Chris would not say that we're lying. A little <laughs> lying. <laughs> Maybe we're a little, we're, we're a little bit more aggressive with uh, how, how much we believe in it. I think it's pretty clear, though, that both teams and leagues recognize that the secondary market is here to stay. And, and I think it's interesting that in the, la in the last quarter of last year, I think I've got the timing right, Danielle, um, StubHub renewed its partnership with MLB Advanced Media um, and entered into um, a partnership with AEG. And I just wondered if you could talk about the thinking behind those two partnerships and what went into that. Yeah, sure. It was a slightly busy quarter for us. Um, I actually want to add one thing on the conversation these guys were having. We totally believe, actually, you know, providing that gateway. And I think one really interesting thing about what they're going to do is it's going to be agnostic. And so if a team in the NBA has 
a, a partnership with us, like the 76ers, they're actually going to also in, involve like whichever teams, wh whoever their choice is for secondary, which I think is, is really about the fan. You're giving them the full choice rather than just the Ticketmaster exchange teams. So it's really important to note. Um, so for baseball, yeah, we had a five-year deal. We renewed it um, for another five years. I'll start with baseball first. Uh, it was, it's been an extraordinary you know, five years, and the reason they renewed it is because of the brand, the consumer brand that we've built. So at this point, we have you know, over 16 million people a month that, that use us. Um, we have 20 million tickets on our site for 30,000 events. Um, we are just basically like the consumer brand of choice for access to get into an event. Um, our obsessive focus on customer service was something that really drove their decision. Like they just, we have 400 people dedicated to customer service. It's very hard to replicate. Uh, we spend a lot of time with the, at the individual team level, in their box office, working with them on analytics related to pricing. Um, they get all of our feeds for all of our data. Um, and most importantly, the baseball season is 81 home games. It is a very, very hard sell at the season ticket level. Um, so there's a huge amount of trust uh, with, with consumers that actually buy baseball tickets, both season ticket holders themselves and people that buy individual game tickets. So um, it, was, it was definitely a commitment to the future for baseball, for us, and for them. We share a common vision, which sort of gets me to the AEG relationship, which is um, very deep and global. It's not just including the United States. So for those of you guys that don't know, they own the Staples Center, they own the O2 arenas globally. Um, they also have started a competing ticket, ticketing primary system to Ticketmaster and the ones that are out there. Um, so we all share the same commitment to the fan and, and innovation and creating the best experience for fans. And uh, since we're in Boston, <laughs> yeah, um, I was wondering if you could just explain what happens with the Red Sox and Ace ticketing. And for those of you who don't know, um, StubHub is, as I understand it, the official online reseller. And yet, it's when a you, nice, complicated animal. <laughs> yes. say, and when you go to an actual Red Sox game, if you walk down a block from the stadium, there is an outpost of Ace Ticket where you can go and purchase tickets on the secondary market from Ace. Yeah, Sharon and I talked about whether to, to talk about this. You know, it's, it's a really interesting thing. Like Ace, if you're from Boston, is very well known. They're a large broker. Um, they also sell on StubHub as a broker. Um, and at the same time, they have an official relationship with the Boston Red Sox as do we, as the StubHub. So we are the official online ticket marketplace. The important distinction is we're not a broker and we don't take inventory. We never take inventory. We're a pure market play, just like our parent eBay. So they, Ace is a broker and they have an offline relationship. I don't really know what goes on um, behind the scenes, so I wouldn't be able to address that. But they're in the ballpark, you know, as the official broker, I guess, is the better way of putting it, and we're the official ticket marketplace. So that's probably the best distinction. Yeah. Dave, you want to Yeah, I mean, I think it, in soccer it's kind of interesting because, you know, we have more of a membership model when it comes to, like, our fans being connected to the club. And, you know, there are actual parts of our stadium where people are season ticket holders, but it's almost like an extended family. And so I think one thing with the secondary ticket market that's kind of interesting <coughs> to think about is, you sit there and there's people next to you, maybe the Lopez family and the Kucinich family over here, if they don't actually come to the game and there's someone else there, it could affect your experience as a season ticket holder. So I think that's something to think about from a fan perspective that actually could alter how you kind of adopt the secondary market. But you guys only have 17 home games in your schedule and your tickets yeah. are much cheaper. So it's such a better dynamic for, for the fan, for the real season ticket holder. Yeah, exactly. And so that experience when they're together and in that setting, um, you know, obviously is something that they want to experience with other people. And I think you see that in Europe. I mean, it's a big deal to sit there with the other rowdies or alters or whatever you want to call them and have this great experience. And so I think for us, you know, we love the secondary market. It's great for our season ticket holders to be able to monetize it. But by the same token, we want to make sure that we position our experience in a way that gives the best long-term value for our fans connected to our, our club. Phil, have you looked at how the secondary ticket market affects the experience of fans in Kansas City? It, it, it's, it's, it's ever evolving, mm -hmm. right? We, uh, in Kansas City, one of the 35th largest or 31st largest EMA in the United States, it's very interesting, but we have the fourth largest building. 
So we have a unique circumstance there where we're marketing, whether it's primary or whether it's our single game tickets or our package products, and understanding and educating as it relates to the secondary. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we're using season ticket holder cards as a means of entry. We basically ripped off the band-aid of the old paper ticket and are primarily educating our fans about the advantage of using a season ticket holder card as it relates to merchandise and concessions and then understanding the ramifications of how that relates to our secondary ticketed products. Mm -hmm. I just have a question now, switching a little bit to dynamic pricing. I'm wondering, you know, are leagues and teams open to dynamic pricing without floors? And, and I'd be interested in hearing mm -hmm. your perspective as well, Chris, but are, are you guys open to dynamic I mean, we're, pricing we're, Yeah, floors? we're very open to that. I mean, we've experimented with some of our bigger games. We have a game every year against the Galaxy at Stanford Stadium. We have 50,000 fans. And you know that's a game where traditionally we hadn't done it originally dynamic pricing, and you saw just huge you know premiums, $100 per ticket, um, in the best seats. And so we said, hey, maybe we're mispricing this, we're leaving money on the table. And so how do we have a better model, and how do we do it in an effective way? The challenge is the Wednesday night when you do it, and it drops through the floor, and that kind of undermines what you're doing with your season ticket base. And so we don't have that many games, like you said before, 17, 20 games with the internationals. So you just got to make sure you have enough demand to, you know, have that make sense. Phil? I think it's slightly different with the NFL. Uh, I know there's a lot of committee process work that needs to go through ownership as it relates to that. One of the ways that the NFL, or specifically the Kansas City Chiefs, may leverage that is if there's an opponent we know that is going to come into town and they're going to be a high, high level of draw, then that will be, that game will be, partnered into a package product that we might have as a, a five-game pick'em plan or a three-game divisional plan, and we'll leverage that that way, but not necessarily from a pricing standpoint. And Chris, open to it? Yeah, in fact, yeah, he is. <laughs> very open to it. I am. I embrace it. Um, I, I think ultimately we want to be at a point where there are no floors, where there are no ceilings, and fans have the ultimate flexibility um, with which to price their tickets. Um, in order to resell. I think the, the one sort of soft caveat I would say is I don't want to impose my views on our teams. So I think our teams will ultimately be the arbiter of should there be a floor for some amount of time? Um, should it be 50% below the face value, 70% below face value, or no floor at all? So my personal bias is no floors, no ceilings, but ultimately I would want the teams to make that decision as I am a state's rights kind of guy. <laughs> just just yeah. generally, how flexi much flexibility do you give NBA teams, you know, is they have, they have total control yes. over what they can do? Yes. They because do. the markets are so different. Exactly. I, I'm sorry, yeah, Danielle, you look like you have something. Oh, I, mean, I was today. I don't think I interrupted, but I will add one thing, which I think is really important. Um, I love dynamic pricing because we were, that's in essence our business model from the very beginning. People dynamically price every day on StubHub, and they have for the last 12 years. I just find it really entertaining when people talk about dynamic pricing in the primary because for the most part, it's dynamically being priced up, uh, per Chris's point. There's no, there's a floor, so it's been artificially restrained where there's no dynamic pricing down. So for true dynamic pricing, it should be going both directions. I don't, I don't think that's particularly true with us. I think one of the things you see our teams doing now, and Cole, you know this well, is we're starting to variable price our season yeah. tickets as well. Mm -hmm. So now the season ticket is not $100 a game. Some games yeah. the season ticket is priced at 20 Depending or 30 Depending on which day of the week. And exactly, absolutely. which allows us to go all the way the down. Variable pricing is so. great. But, but for teams like the Giants, you know, the San Francisco Giants, who they, there's a, a floor, and for most of the teams in baseball, there's floors for, vari for dynamic pricing. Those are two different animals, variable sure. and dynamic. So it's just, it'd, it'd be great to see the algorithm be able to include elements that force it down for the consumer, because it's a cheaper ticket. Yeah, I think the challenge so far has been twofold, right? It's been, it's been the technology that hasn't been there to help us do it right. right. And it's been, it's been more, of a, more of a universal buy-in, philosophical buy-in of whether I do want to do it yeah. and how do I want to do it. And, and what, I've, what I'm encouraged by, as, as far as the industry goes, across all of the, not just sports, but on the entertainment side as well and what we're doing with Live Nation on, on our concerts that we started last year, and you'll see even more of that with optimal pricing, dynamic pricing this year. And then what I'm also encouraged by on the sports side is that both, both of those gaps are closing. On the technological side, we have, we have good companies that have already been out there making good, decent strides on dynamic pricing. We've made some, some substantial strides in what we've done just in the last year. We have 
15 plus sports teams in an 18 month period when we've launched our dynamic pricing engine that are now using our, our price master product. That price master product priced 900 different events, dynamically priced 900 different events last year, something close to 2.5 million tickets that were dynamically priced last year. In, in comparison, the prior year, we had dynamically priced about uh, 300,000. So the growth of the events and the tickets that are now being dynamically priced through the life cycle of the event, it's pretty substantial. Um, so to me, both of those leaps, both of those gaps are being closed, both on the technology side and the philosophical side, and that's really encouraging as teams get better at, at really improving their, their yield across the board. I mean, I think one thing is it's just important not to lose sight of the fans and the optics, mm -hmm. because if you're gouging your fans or there's a perception of that, I think it undermines <clears throat> everything you're doing in the community. And to build a fan base and have fans who are going to be with you for a generation or multi-generation. So we're very conscious of that to make sure that it's not like, oh my God, it's $185 to go to an earthquake game. That's ridiculous. And so I think you always have to keep that in light when you're doing the dynamic pricing and, and all the different pricing variables. Because if not, it's going to be the silent fan. They're just not going to show up, and you're going to wonder why they don't return your phone calls. They're pissed off. And so I think that's an important consideration when you kind of make these strategic decisions. I think that's right. It's also, what's interesting though, it's also an, edu it's an, it's a, it's an issue of education, right? Okay. So quick show of hands. How many people in this room have bought an airline ticket before in their life? Just quickly. Okay, now everybody that has their hand up. How many people believe that in buying an airline ticket, they bought, they were, they, they were part of dynamic pricing? All right, so that's pretty much everybody. Right, so you know that you participate already in an industry that. Wait, how many people like how many, buying? How many people like buying airline tickets? Yeah, or like the airlines. Right, right. they have a negative brand. Right, but they, they don't, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. Maybe that's not the model. Right, right. not necessarily right. because of the price. That the price. <laughs> well, that it's paying. related to the it's price. It's because their pillows and their dinner got taken away. Those are two completely different. <laughs> two completely different no, problems. No, it's because but, the pricing. Right, but the point is, everybody buying buying a ticket in the airline industry today understands that there are different variables that dictate what the price of that ticket is going to be depending on when you buy that ticket, where you're going, what time of day you're flying, all of those factors, right? So there's a general understanding and acceptance as us of business, tra of business or personal travelers of how that price is going to vary. So it's incumbent upon us as an industry then, as a sports business, to say to that fan, it's not terribly dissimilar. There are going to be different variables that drive the demand for that product, the demand for that ticket, up, up and down, that we as a, as a business, we as a, as, a, as, a, as a team, as a league, um, are going to certainly, certainly participate in. I think the issue is we're not running an airline. I mean, the issue is we're running a sports team, and people have an emotional connection to the club, and if you gouge them with the ticket prices, you're going to turn them off. And so that's my, my belief. <laughs> Chris, Chris, yeah. Chris Granger? I don't, I, I don't know why you keep using the term gouge. Because well, dynamic pricing is up and down. So like if, if you look at the Warriors, the Warriors do a fantastic job of dynamic pricing. Their site is so transparent. So in fact, they highlight this price is really low. This is a great deal right now. So I think it's actually fan friendly to the extent that you recognize for your fans that that Tuesday night game against a lesser opponent should be priced down. And but we should charge it's, you something it's, it, it, That is true, but I think with the fans, anchor to are the big prices. And that's where the story gets written in the paper, and that's where people get pissed off. And so I, I just think that- a shitty PR department, that's where the story I, I think is, it's right? Not, I think it's naive to think that fans do not understand that when it's more expensive, or you know, basically this trade-off between the less expensive and the more expensive. I think you're not giving the fans enough credit. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I disagree. I think, pan, I think fans would say, yes, I understand that paying f more for the Miami Heat game on a Saturday night, um, I, I would do that. And well, just I'm, as I, I would I think pay having a different price is okay. What I'm saying is, is that if you push too much. Oh, of course. I and, totally agree. And, I totally and, agree. And the that. optics look bad, that you're going to end up in a situation where fans are upset. I totally agree. And I think agree. that's happening. I totally agree. When I, and I think it's, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that fans are out there, they don't have a lot of discretionary dollars, they're spending this, you know, this is money that they're hard-earned money, and they feel bad when it gets to a certain point, they can't do it. And so if you push them that hard and they feel that it's too much, they're gonna turn away from you. But I agree, but the market is the best arbiter of that. So if you're pricing so high that fans start turning away in, as a response, then you're gonna see that in your attendance numbers and you're gonna see that in but your But you might not numbers. see it for several years. That's the thing. People, it's gonna be over time. And I think if you've seen these sports with all these empty seats, and there's plenty of them because all of us have been to the games, it's partially the silent fan. 
that is turning away from the expensive tickets. Yeah, but that has, I think that, that's not just dynamic pricing. That's just inefficient pricing, period, in the primary. So like the Yankees coming out with $850 legend seats has nothing to do with, with dynamic pricing. It's just, it's, it's inefficient pricing. It wasn't priced properly in the first place. So I just, I think pricing in general is the issue and whether it's too high or too low. Dynamic but it, yeah, is a better reflection. You have to look at a long-term view. What is the whole value of that customer over Absolutely. 5, 10, 15 years? And I think if you don't think about it on those terms, then you're going to end up hurt and you're going to end up being, you know, upstaged by other forms of entertainment. I want to get into a little bit more about knowing your fan and how you figure out what your fan wants. And I know both Dave and, and Chris, not surprisingly, have strong opinions about this too. But if, Chris, if you could talk about sort of the behavioral research, research you do into NBA fans. I know you look closely at, at purchases, merchandise purchases at the NBA store and, and you, you track tickets and so on and so forth. What the NBA is doing. We're, our teams are doing really nice work on trying to understand what drives a renewal decision um, based largely on the behaviors we see them doing. So to the extent that their tickets are or are not being utilized, not just by them, but by somebody because they're forwarding their ticket to a friend because they're reselling their ticket somewhere else. The extent to which they're a first year season ticket holder versus a fifth year season ticket holder. The extent to which they're a broker. The extent to which they are spending money with the team store or on other NBA merchandise. Um, the extent to which they live within five miles of the arena or 50 miles within the arena. We can sort of isolate all of those things, make a difference ultimately in the renewal decision. And when you run those through a model, you get a very good sense of the likelihood that someone is going to renew their tickets or not going to renew their tickets. Um, and as such, it allows the team to work with those season ticket holders separately based on what we expect they're about to do. So it's sort of our first foray into sort of political style targeting. Um, and we're finding it to be very effective um, and predictive and it helps guide our, our efforts with our season ticket holders. And I know, uh, Bill and Dave, you have unique and different circumstances. Yeah. Dave, you're in a very tech-savvy yeah. market in San Jose. And, and Bill, I'll put it this way, you're in a less tech-savvy <laughs> marketplace yeah. in Kansas City. Oh, come on. Barbecue yeah. is fantastic. <laughs> but, 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 but as you have told me, you are working on getting that, that tech intelligence up there. So if the, if the both of you could talk about mm -hmm. how you look at fan behavior, what you are doing to reach out to your fans yeah. and make sure they're satisfied, happy customers. I mean, obviously in Silicon Valley, folks are very tech savvy. You know, they're kind of demanding products, whether it's on an app where they can actually watch the replays, MLS Match Day Live, you know, 10 minutes after the goal is scored, or, you know, paperless tickets and all these different technologies. They're quick to adopt them. They want them used. They want to make sure there's Wi-Fi at the venue so they can actually use it in an effective way. And so we actually have to build a model around that and those needs. And so we look at those specific demographics and make sure that it works. We also have very young fans. You know, a lot of our fans are millennials, Gen Ys. They're also very prone to want to make sure they're sharing their experiences socially, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or, or Foursquare or whatever. And so we need to facilitate that as well. And so we're creating an experience and making sure we're doing things like we have Yorder, where you can on your phone, it's actually a, a PayPal company, you can actually order food and it's just delivered to you. So you never need to miss the action. In soccer, you don't want to miss the action. It could be a goal at any time. It's continuous you know, flow sport. And so boom, <laughs> the food comes to you, it comes with you basically within 20 minutes and you get hot chocolate or you get a hot dog or you get a beer or whatever you want. And so our fans are looking for those kind of things and if we don't provide them, then you're gonna be behind the eight ball. So I think that's the challenge that we face. I mean, and you feel you're, you're in the education business. Yeah. You know, we're in the education business. We're all in the edu yeah, education business. Um, and, and it is a burgeoning uh, entrepreneurial um, technology hub, small little hub that's growing in Kansas City in the Kansas City metro area. But what we have found in our research, and we introduced a season ticket holder card in our 50th season last year. And the card, just to give you a synopsis, it, it was a barcode, so it's nothing new. But that card became their physical ticket, but it also became their membership, if you will. It became something of a status symbol to say, I've got this red card, I sit in the lower bowl, I'm on the 50 yard line, or I'm in the suite, or I'm in the club level, or I'm two rows down from uh, the end zone. And that was a kind of a band-aid approach to rip off the old paper ticket, because with the old paper ticket, all we knew was the scan count. 
We didn't know anything else. And now with the card, that allows you to know who's got the card, when the card's coming in, when are they gonna be coming in through the turnstiles or through the scanner, uh, when are they purchasing now, because we've connected it to the, uh, the point of sale at the merchandise or at the concessionaire, what they're buying, why they're buying it. And we entitled that with our 50th season in Kansas City with some entitlements in that to promote the use of the card. And what we have found, we just finished some focus groups, what we found was education's key. Because in technology, and maybe in a market that is not quote unquote tech savvy, they're willing to understand. You just have to take the time to explain what the benefits are. So we did videos with our Chiefs Insider to say, here's how we use the car. We took, we literally did a whole production around a Kenny Chesney concert where we used the card as a test and showed fans exactly the processes and the steps to go through. The amazing part about that is if you don't take that steps and you just go into it, your adoption is going to be 100% or because you're not going to have a card without it, right? You can't get into the game. But there's more of a, if you will, a, a grace about it that you're going to get the adoption level up higher because you're educating them about the process. We found in the focus groups that 50% of them, and let's just say uh, the average age of 39 and higher didn't like it, and the average age of 25, 39 really liked it. And so we have to continue to educate and move them along that spectrum. But the spectrum wasn't opt-in. The spectrum is we're doing this, and this is how we want to educate you to be a part of that process. How's fan satisfaction been? Have you guys gauged fan satisfaction since you launched the cards last yes. year? Yes. Has it been? Uh, it, it, it varied because of the education. Some fans, they have the ability to email any ticket to anybody at any time through Ticketmaster with us. We, that's part of our deal. And some fans, just in the focus group the other day was great. He's like, I think it's just horrible that I have to take my fan card. And if I want to give the fan card to my next door neighbor, I have to walk it across the street to do that. Right. And I said, well, I didn't say the moderator <laughs> said. I wrote the note behind the glass and then handed it over. to somebody. And he's like, did you know that you could email your ticket to your next door neighbor up to 15 minutes the night before or whenever you wanted to? And he goes, no, I didn't know that. Now, we made it clear, but that's the ongoing education. So I think our fan satisfaction will continue to go up yeah. because of the ongoing education that we're going to do. And, and let me ask you, sorry, another modified question. No, go ahead. <laughs> sure. It's yeah. cold. It's your panel. Fair. Please jump in. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, what, what, what do you feel an effect it has had on renewals for this upcoming year and your season ticket base on the whole? Well, we had a difficult season. Um, so, I wasn't going to say anything about cheap. it. So thanks for letting That's everybody right. know about that. 99% We're moving renewal. forward. That's right. Uh, I, I think it's had an effect in this way, and, and we have measured this. The fact that it was our 50th season in Kansas City, we did a unique, every season ticket holder account got a jersey that they could name and they could number that was personalized to them in honor of our 50th season and also with the Nike program. I, <laughs> And then we kicked off this entitlement program where you could get discounts at the merchandise, you could get discounts at. I think that all helps. And the overall modicum behavior was great. That is good. You're valuing me more right. as a comparison set to there. But that's not the full set of the story. We need to continue to drive season ticket holder value. We need to continue to drive the fact that we care about them. We gotta walk in the shoes of the season ticket holder. We have to walk in the shoes of our fans each and every day, and that's the confluence between the technology river and the humanness of what it's like to be a fan. And that's the hardest part about merging the technology with the behavior of the humans, because we have to walk in their footsteps. So we did those whole maturations, and it's getting better. Is it where we need to be? No, it needs to be better. Good. Thank you, Cole. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. I, I, uh, jumping off of the technology point, uh, I'm interested to know from Ticketmaster and StubHub, what are you know, the recent innovations technologically that you guys are looking at that you're excited about? And maybe we'll start with Danielle on that one. So StubHub at its core is clearly like a disruptive company, right? We started out 10 years ago, 12 years ago actually, and we've always been focused on innovation and we definitely disrupted the value chain of the rights holder and the consumer, right, in that dialogue with the ticket. Um, so, so now that we're sort of at a place where we're more mature and we are a consumer brand, uh, we were purchased by eBay set almost seven years ago. Uh, so we, we have at our disposal PayPal, we have at our disposal a lot of our sister companies and we work very, very closely. Um, so what David was mentioning, we're working pretty closely on this sort of 
integrating s in, in um, some of the venues where we have primary ticketing relationships, uh, working on apps that do point of sale, that do ordering from seat. Uh, we're working really closely with our sister companies um, for the complete picture of, of that fan and having the dialogue um, as an eBay family of companies. We've recently bought a company that does 3D mapping from view from section. Um, so we're starting to roll that across the site. Uh, we've just introduced all-in pricing, which is where everything's transparent. Uh, there's no fees, uh, which is highly innovative for our industry. Um, so we've done that with baseball, and we plan on rolling it out to the rest of the site by the end of the year. So you know, we're definitely focused on how to make that, that dialogue with the fan um, the best it can be, and how to offer some of the you know, social aspects. The event, an event is the most social event. It's, it's, it's the epitome of what you want to share. Like, I know I go to concerts, and I try very hard to send pictures out, but it never works, of course, with the bandwidth issues. But yeah. there's lots of aspects to attending an event that are social. So we're also really focused on social. And then lastly, um, and I'm sure Cole will talk about this, mobile. Mobile is huge for all of us. Um, mobile for StubHub is going to be about 20% of our sales next year. Uh, we see a spike in traffic um, for peak times like Super Bowl. It's 30% of our traffic is coming from mobile. Uh, so it's a co perishable commodity. Um, buying at the last minute, it's going to become more and more important. So we're spending a lot of time and energy at StubHub thinking about mobile. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, our story's not, not um, dissimilar in that regard. I mean, mobile's, a, mobile's probably one of the biggest um, innovative stakes in the ground for us, uh, innovation stakes in the grounds for us this year. Um, I, I think a couple, of, a couple of things. The first is um, to kind of dovetail a little bit on what we've been already talking about. I mean, digital ticketing is where this industry is going, and it's got to get there soon. Yep. Because um, it's, it is the number one way that we can ensure we know who um, those other 1.5 fans are that are coming through the gates. Um, to the extent that a ticket continues to live in the physical state, I can hand it to Danielle, Danielle can hand it to Chris, Chris can hand it off to, to his buddy, and then suddenly we have no visibility into who, who any of those people were in the, in the process. But if a, if a ticket is issued digitally, and either it's a season ticket card, a team like the Miami Heat putting all their tickets up on account manager and then telling the fan that you can go manage your tickets there, and then you can put your ticket on your mobile device or you can put it on your credit card, um, to the extent those tickets continue to live digitally, there's a greater opportunity for the teams to have insight into those tickets every time they change hands or if they do, in fact, uh, resell. So what you're going to see from us this year and, and from really more of the teams is a greater adoption on that across all of the, across all of the leagues. So the Chiefs are one of the teams that are really kind of leading the charge. They're in the, in the vast minority of, of our um, teams doing that. But I think that's, that is what you can see more in the next coming year. Uh, and beyond um, on the innovative front. And then part of that is, is mobile. Mobile's a big deal for us as well. I mean, our, our last year in 212, mobile represented 34% of our total visits. Um, and we're year over year, we're up 130% on mobile sales. Um, so it is, a, it is a big, big heading for us. Mobile, not only mobile ticket delivery, but starting uh, midway through this year, season ticket holders are going to be able to manage their tickets on a mobile device as well. So I can transfer my ticket from my mobile device, I can resell my ticket from my mobile device, and it makes it a lot more convenient for the fan and better for the, better for the team as well. So those are probably two of the biggest areas of innovation uh, on top of everything else that we're doing, sort of obsessing over the fan experience right now. One of the interesting things I think is also happening, and I'd like Chris to speak to this, is, is the cashless stadium. I know the NBA has looked closely at the Brighton Seagulls in the second division, um, and they have a cashless stadium, and it's something you've looked closely at, and, and what, what are you thinking about in terms of the future in the NBA and the cash, cashless experience? Yeah. And it, I mean, it goes along all of these lines. So the, there's a team in England called Brighton Hove Albion. They are a second division football club and their stadium is cashless. So you go in with your ticket on a card, yeah. um, you have loaded value, you have money on your card, that money can then be used, or your card can be used at concession stands, it can be used at merchandise stands, and no cash is transacted in the entire stadium. And what the team has found is that because of that, the throughput of transactions has increased by double digits, Fans put more money or they load more money onto their card and as such they end up spending more on per caps in stadium because it doesn't feel like real money is right. being transacted <laughs> at that point. So it's a fascinating model for all of us um, in the world of sports or who run stadiums and venues because it's just really smart. And then again from a digital ticketing standpoint, 
when those tickets are transferred digitally, the team knows who's in the stadium. That's right. And now I know that Dave is in the stadium, and I know that he likes hot dogs, and I know that he drinks Guinness. And now again, from a service Guinness. standpoint, I can treat him. I, I could. We don't really have, don't like each other. Yeah. Um, so now, like, I can treat him differently than I treat Danielle because I know what she does in the stadium differently. And there's the power of the, sort of the digital ticket sort of broadly defined, like that's where we're headed here. And it's, it's gonna be fantastic for our fans across all sports. We, we had 20,000, if you will, let's use the nomenclature we're talking about, 20,000 digital tickets per game that were used. And of that, a certain subset of that was all brand new people that we had never seen before because wow. of the card and the email forward. I think that's a key point. And Cole, sure. you yeah. know the stats better than I do, but our teams, we probably have roughly half of our teams doing some form of digital ticketing right now, and those who are, are seeing the, the forwards increase by 500%. Um, the data capture thousands of new names in our database as a result of it, and it's just, it's fantastic what we're learning about our fans and their behaviors, and that has great implications for how we service them. Well, and it has, I'll just insert, it, the one thing we haven't talked about yet, right, which is the primary issue of Acon 101 is scarcity. As a team, we are trying to drive ticket scarcity. It's going to help everything out. The primary, it's going to help out the secondary. It's basic Econ 101. And the more that we can service and educate and inform and get those out, then the more leads we're going to have the opportunity to put into the funnel, to in the sales funnel, to fill the stadium, to do everything that we want to do. And to create an amazing fan experience because who doesn't want to be a part of something bigger than themselves? When you've got an NFL game and you've got 76,000 people there and you're there in a captive audience for three hours, that's the place to be, and that's where we want everybody to be. Dave, did you want to talk about? Well, I mean, I think what we're toying with in Silicon Valley is just skipping the card entirely and just going to the phone. And so, kind of like if it's anyone. Baby steps, David. Baby yeah. steps. Well, we're going big. We go big steps. We, go we, big steps. we got baby steps. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you know, the idea is, I don't know if anyone has used like Square, for instance, and you can pay by Square too. So you can obviously take a credit card if you're a merchant. The other thing you can do, and I do this in Palo Alto all the time in Phil's Coffee, you can just, if you're a block away, you can open, you swipe the app and you open up a tab. And when you walk in, they know, because they have like a, uh, an iPad, and they see your face and they're like, oh, hey, Dave, do you want your regular? And they just hand you the coffee right there. And it's that sophisticated. And if you could do that at a stadium, get rid of all the lines and all that kind of BS, I mean, think about the experience would go up by a factor of like you know 10. It would just be so much easier to buy concessions, merchandise, it would just be a great experience for the fans and a great way to demo new technology and new innovative ideas. And so that's kind of the stuff that we're looking to do in our new venue that opens next year. Um, and it's gonna be an exciting time. And here's, the, here's what's interesting to me about, about everything that was just said, which is, which is exactly where we're hoping the industry goes, as Dave, you were touching on, is, is that it was almost sort of the way that you were talking about that. It was almost in this sort of, this, it's coming down the road, it's, it's, it's ticketing sci-fi sort of way. <laughs> What's interesting is that's available right now. And mm -hmm. if you're out there and you're a team and you're thinking about next year's season tickets and fulfilling of season tickets and individual tickets, real. you've got to be thinking about this right now because mobile delivery is there today. You can go exclusively mobile. You can put all of your tickets online and say, Mr. Season Ticket Holder, the only way you're getting your ticket is putting on a mobile device. You can do it across the board with cards, as the, as the Chiefs have done. So it's available today. We as an industry have just got to take that step, which education is a big part of it. It's a leap of faith. It is a, it's a, it's a leap of something. It's a leap of faith, and it's a leap of, of philosophical beliefs. And, and It's also expensive. I mean, you have to re-outfit the venues. You have to yep. get the scanners. Yeah. You have to upgrade the infrastructure to some degree. It's expensive for me, but not for, for these guys. I mean, it's, 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 it's just, expensive yeah. for, it, it, it actually saves the money on average. No, ultimately, we don't need to print the tickets. Yeah, you don't have to yeah. print it on average. That, that, that was never the intent, right? Never, the intent course. is all clearly based on innovation. That's right. we, got, yeah, we got great work from the NFL League offices and Bobby Gallo and Brian LaFamina to say, you know what, it's all about the proof of concept and going out and doing right. that because it's already out there. You're right. Mm -hmm. right. But it let's exists. introduce it because, you know, when I walked into the Chief, it was like, well, they get paper tickets and they've had them on the walls for yeah. 40 plus years and you're going to take that away? Oh, that's going to go over well. Yeah. And that's real. Yeah. But they're still getting, I mean, in your case, they're still getting something that is physical and tangible and I can hold it. It's commemorative. I think the, the, um, in, in, our, in, the in the NBA world, um, you know, the Atlanta Hawks have done a really good job with that, with their card and how, how commemorative that looks and how, so, so you can still do right. that and go, and go digital and still right. give them something that they can hold. And we can give them a digital that. card now too, right, as the follow-up, right. or a digital image from that game. That's it's right. a memorable game, you can email it to them right after the game, after a win, and another fabulous touch point. So there's, 
There's so many. I mean, I think the interesting it. thing that we're trying to do with the millennials with our Match Day Live app is actually give them kind of badges. So let's say you've been to 20 straight games. You have a badge next to your name when you interact, when you're on Twitter, or if you're interacting with other fans. Wow, that guy's you know got a special badge. He's been at 20 straight games, or wow, he's been a season ticket holder since 1974 when the Earthquakes first came. Those kind of things, people have, take great pride in those things, especially when they can share them with other people. And so that gives you kind of status in the community. And so I think there are ways to do it digitally that are actually cooler than even you know just having a physical ticket. That's right. On the same line with technology and digital tickets upgrade technology. I know that's something the NBA is um, using now with experience, I believe, and San Jose is also with experience. experience. Um, maybe Chris and Dave and anyone else who wants to chime in, talk about the future being upgrade technology. I, I, I think there's multiple vendors who are doing a nice job right now in the space Pogo of seat, upgrade, really exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's great, so Leap you seat. walk into um, you walk into the venue and, and you can talk about it than I can. You walk into your venue on your phone, it says, would you like to upgrade your seat for $10? Click here if yes. This is what the view of that seat will look like. Um, and you can just do that right there from your phone. It's fantastic. But it's not just sort of upgrade technology. It's upgrade, it's ordering food from yep. your phones, to which you've already talked about. Um, I just, I think there's a host of, of neat things right now that are, that are gonna make the fan experience um, more flexible more flexible um, that, that I think Ticketmaster is doing a nice job of partnering with all of the, not all the providers, yeah, but, but multiple providers yeah. in the space, yep. um, again, in order to allow the teams to make a decision on what's best for their fans. That's what you have to do. I mean, the reality is we're not going to pick the best horse because uh, it's up, the, the teams are going to have um, greater insights into what company works better with them. Does that mean so, you partner with us? It, no, because you're a competitor. But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, the, I think the, the, the jury's still out on um, on, on yeah. the upgrades, I think that it's I think that's a convenient technology for both the teams and the fans. Um, do I think that it's it's um, a, a huge revenue driver for the teams? I'm not convinced of that mm -hmm. just yet, but I think that oftentimes convenience can trump can trump the dollars for both the team and the fan. I, I don't think it's about making a lot of money off yeah. of it. I, I do think about. Um, it's, it's cool for the fans it's to have delight. that opportunity. That's delight. right, and, and it's also, a, it, it, there's a data play there. there there's understanding yeah, which, which of your fans are coming in that are actually willing to spend sort of like the ARPU, you know, what, getting more revenue out of your, out of your user than, than they, they initially paid. So understanding which of your fans are actually willing to pay a little bit more for, for tickets. But we've got, we, we, we're working already with two of the guys out there, Leap Seats and, and Pogo Seats. And um, we're very, very, I think it's this year's Groupon. I think I told you this a couple of weeks ago. I think it's this year's hot topic, what everybody's discussing as far as what could be sort of a slight needle mover for the teams. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how this year pans out and what it does for the teams and for the fans. I mean, I, in San Jose, it was kind of funny. You know, our, our current stadium, it's too small for us, only 10,000 seats. There weren't enough differentiated, like, vantage points because the stadium's already yeah. so small that it, people didn't upgrade because they didn't feel they needed to. Like, so that was actually, I think, one shortcoming. You need to have differentiated you know, locations that make sense. And then secondly, when we did it at Stanford, our game where we had 50,000 against the Galaxy, we actually had to put like SWAT teams of people out there, like brightly colored with iPads, to let people know that they could even do it and then actually walk them through it. And so that education was actually pretty intensive to get people to use it. You can't just like send some email blasts and expect them to, get, to, to figure it out because it's kind of a new customer behavior. And so through that, I mean, it's, it's pretty intensive and it's not really a money maker. It's more of just a, a service yep. that we offer Agreed. to our fans. Agreed. We've got to be brand stewards of technology. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the new buzz term is going to be for that, mm -hmm. but that's what we have to do. When we're educating about technology, it, it needs to be thought in the, in, the, in, the, in the footsteps of the customer, but we need to, we have to, continually remind them over and over and over again. And that's market specific, I get that. But you're right, I mean, in, in San Jose, it may be intuitive, but in yeah. other markets, it may not be. And yeah, I think the, we as clubs at times go, oh, we've just instituted this initiative and it's done and we got good feedback and you might do a focus group or you might not. You know, it's a continual process because this technology thing is gonna evolve and we have to bring the consumers up to speed with it. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to turn it over to some audience questions. I see. Oh, two sheets. Thank you. Ah. And I think the first one, both Dave and Bill um, can chime in on. But it says, David, 
Dave, what lessons can be learned from European soccer, specifically mm -hmm. with regards to fan experience? I think that speaks mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. your relationship with um, Spurs, the Spurs yeah. um, and the membership experience. Mm -hmm. And then I know, Bill, the Chiefs also look to the EPL yep. um, for fan experience. So both of you want you address Yeah, that? I mean, I, I think this is one of the big differentiators that you know soccer has, and I think we can look internationally and, and kind of see this unbelievable connection that the fans in Europe have to their clubs. I mean, it is, it's a nationalistic kind of thing that you don't see here in the States um, as much, especially because sometimes people are fans of three or four teams in one city, and it's kind of all concentrated on their soccer team. And so I think that fervor and intensity and how it's nurtured and cultivated is something that we, we're trying to do with the earthquakes and really create a membership model where fans feel that they're part of a club that they're not really just a ticket holder. We don't want to use that term ticket holder. Right. We want to use member, club, you know, whatever it is. I mean, we've gone so far as in our new stadium, every section is going to have a neighborhood leader, someone who actually kind of oversees that area in the same way that you'd have like a neighborhood organization, you know, in, a, in Menlo Park, California, or, you know, Brockton, Massachusetts, or whatever. And so that is a totally novel concept. That's what they've done in England in places like Chelsea and West Ham and things like that. And we can learn a lot from that because that connection that you forge with those families and those, te those fans is much stronger than just going to one game. You know, it's almost part of their whole life. And if we can do that in sports, then we actually really accomplish something. So that's the model that we're going with. I love it. And I think the extension of that is we start to talk about this like it's not a ticket. It's not about right. buying mm -hmm. 41 right. games. It's, not. it's you're buying into a 12-month experience yeah. mm -hmm. that happens to include tickets to these games, yep. but it also gets you this and this wine tasting event and mm -hmm. this kids clinic and this business to business event. But to the extent that we can broaden the conversation beyond just a season ticket, um, I completely agree with that approach. I think mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Bill, and, and the EPL as far as the Well, I'm I, I just going to mention our late founder, Lamar Hunt, oh, was a visionary yeah, was. and uh, obviously involved in all kinds of aspects of American football, soccer as we know it, and, and tennis and other sports. And what was interesting, back in Municipal Stadium, that was the stadium prior to Arrowhead, there was a Wolfpack Club, and mm -hmm. it was the member's model, if you will, or, or the Cleveland Dog Pound, you could uh, refer to it as. And it was a member's model where they sat in a certain area, they got rowdy or mm -hmm vociferous, whatever term you'd like to use. And we're going to reinvestigate that because that, that is a, a common element in all of our businesses of that fan base. Everybody wants to look at it and, or either be a part of it mm -hmm. and see and feel that energy. And so we're going to look at that model again and merge that into a loyalty program. So it would be a membership program and a loyalty program so that you're rewarded to use your card, ultimately the phone. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do that, but at the same time feel a part of that membership of the specific area and obviously being a part of something bigger than yourself where you can make a difference or have an outcome in the game because of your loud I mean, nature. We see that with our ultras, our super fans. I mean, they meet like three or four weeks before the game and they make elaborate TIFO displays that are That's as right. big as this entire room. And they're painted themselves. They have seamstresses that it's their second job and they're seaming all these different you know, sheets together, painting them. They have huge parties, people come to them. I mean, it's like a real community bonding experience. And then at the game, they display them. And it's like you're in Europe. I mean, it's incredible to see that. Can, can I just add one thing, though? Because we have three Premier League partners. And I just want to, they still have an attendance problem. There's still a problem with no-shows. Like, they are pretty high as far as no-show rates. And so it, pricing is still an issue. And mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely essential to do what you guys are talking about and add more on an annual basis, making it an experience, making it year-round because it, they're suffering from the same issues that U.S. sports are suffering from, which is, you know, no-show rates, low yeah. attendance, people go to, there's still like huge loyalty, but those are for the really popular games. And we know because they came to us and we're partners with three of them. And it's just, it's in, there's a lot of offloading to brokers on, with rela related mm -hmm. to inventory. So it's still, they, they suffer from the same problems that U.S. sports Well, especially because a lot of them have newer, like Arsenal has a much bigger stadium. Absolutely. And so, I mean, it's soft. It's still soft. Yeah. Even though it's English Premier League, it's still it, soft. It's scarcity. It's what you said oh, before. I mean, if you can get to the point, you know, our plan with our new stadium with 18,000 seats is to sell 10 or 12,000 season tickets and have a wait list of 5,000 people like the Portland Timbers. And then you just control the, it's like putting a, a top of a, um, pot on top of all of the demand and it's just like people stay in they know if they give up their season ticket 
they're going to have to get at the end of the line. And that is so powerful in this business if you're able to do that. And you, have to, you, know, you can't control it totally. You don't know how the team's going to perform, but you can decide to build a stadium that's 18,000 instead of 25,000 for that very reason. And so those are the kind of things you can do to you know, make that better. I think this might be for, for Cole and Danielle. What sports are selling the best in secondary markets? What sports are selling the best? The best. Um, so I won't, instead of touching on what sports are selling the best, I'll tell you what sport is, is right now the most innovative, and that's the NBA. I'd say if Chris wasn't on the stage that's right now. not answering the question. Um, I, I, I like I, that answer. I, 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 uh, answer the question. Well, I, 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 my, 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 my thing is I, I'm, I'm less concerned about who's selling well in the past because the way we've been doing it in the past is not how we're going to be doing it in the future. And so right now, the teams that are, the, 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 the leagues and the sports that to me are leading the charge and, and, or the league that's leading the charge uh, is definitely the NBA. I think that, that for them to recognize now where we are in, in, in um, ticketing and, and ticketing technology and, and the behaviors of fans and the needs of fans for the NBA and for Chris and Adam and others to say, we recognize that fans um, want all of their options in one place, so let's go sell them, sell them tickets, to, sell tickets to them in that way, um, I think is great. I think the NFL has done a phenomenal job at, um, at, at consolidating their, they were the first league to say, hey, we can't have 30 different exchange brands out there and they were the first league to say we need to point all of our fans to one place if we're going to participate better in the secondary market so the NFL's done a great job there and the NHL is is now um, is now getting there as well when they launch their their new NHL ticket exchange here before too long so I, I, I that's the way that I would categorize how the leagues have been performing in the last in the last few years okay I'll answer, answer the, the question, question now <laughs> okay yeah, yeah, so yeah. Uh, um, but it's, it's very <coughs> diplomatic um, so from our perspective, well, the BCS championship game was the number one selling event in StubHub history. Wow. So I thought that you guys would find that really interesting. Um, we've definitely made significant investments on the college side. We have over 30 partners, including the top 10 athletic programs. But that just goes to show you the breadth of, you know, of college football. Uh, the Super Bowl is our second highest on an annual basis, uh, a huge market always very successful. We have a healthy competition with the NFL Ticket Exchange. Competition's good, it makes everyone better. Um, so NFL sells very well for us, and then obviously, you know, baseball. Baseball is uh, 81 home games, there's lots of people that want to unload, and um, there's lots of games they can't make, and so um, that would be from a sports perspective, and then, you know, NBA and NHL, of course, but those are the, the leading on the sports side. Music has been a huge area of growth for, for StubHub. Um, it's actually the number one, what we call genre, um, period for us at the, at the moment, which used to be, it sort of varies that depending on the year. Um, but music is a very big sector for StubHub. Now let's see here. Um, somebody wants to know, Bill, what's the next step for KC after the STH cards? How are you using data from the card? We're going to put a, we're in process right now of uh, building out a full CRM with the fan loyalty program. So we're working uh, with Microsoft Dynamics and Ski Data to do all that. We're putting a whole model in place. We didn't have one in place, uh, which is uh, unfortunate, but we're, we're now doing that. So we're answering, I, I used this analogy earlier with somebody, we're getting on the 405 and we are putting on the gas because that's what you have to do at this Have level. you ever driven the 405? I have <laughs> driven the 405. <laughs> Carmageddon. Not a lot of gas. Is, that, is it an oxymoron? <laughs> yeah, 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 is that what you're saying? Yeah, right. Well, at four in the morning, when you go that's on right, the That's right. It's exactly right. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. You must live in Santa Monica. <laughs> um, but, and, and so we're putting the loyalty program together. We're putting all, that is the next step. And then the medium of the card changes. David already alluded to it. And the card then goes to here. So now I, I was on my flight here under Chicago. I saw you know, a guy I was talking with, he just kind of put his scanner there and he yeah. read underneath cool. and no big deal and he's in. So the technology's there and this is where it's gonna be. And now then once it goes to the phone, I'm sure there's gonna be possibilities beyond possibilities that we'll spend a whole panel on next year talking about where do we take that data and where does that go. But understanding our fans. Mm -hmm. We need to understand the behavior of our <clears throat> fans and not only to use it for purposes, for financial purposes, but to be relevant. The days of mass emailing or the days of just saying, hey, I'm sending you this and I'm sending you that. No. If somebody says to me, I'm a country western fan, then they're going to get the offer when we have Kenny Chesney at Arrowhead. Mm -hmm. 
But if they say they're not a country western fan, these are basic, basic analogies and examples, I'm not sending them that offer because when I send that, I'm confirming to them that I don't understand them. And that's what this is all about. We need to understand the consumer so well that it doesn't border on the, I know you too well, but just enough to say they get it. Yeah, I mean, we've done that with Yorder, which is the company through PayPal, where like, you know, my wife at the games always orders hot chocolate, like in the 60th minute. And so we would get all that data, and so then they would just turn it around, and in the 58th minute, they would just send her a, a push alert on her phone that says, how many hot chocolates do you want? And so that you can be that sophisticated. Yeah. The technology all exists. And then it's like, oh, yeah, boom, I'll just do my regular order. Boom, it comes. So I mean, that leads to, obviously, more sales. You feel like they you know, they know you. Obviously, there's a little bit of a privacy issue with some of that stuff. But I think a lot of people, especially the younger generation, are kind of fine with that. And so we're kind of willing to push the envelope 25, on 2539, yes. Yeah. So. Another questioner wants to know, how much do leagues, teams, StubHub, and Ticketmaster share data? I'm assuming they mean team to team, league to league, StubHub to team. Sorry, what was the question? How much share, share data? data? Share data. How much do teams, leagues, StubHub, and Ticketmaster share data? Who wants to go first? Well, I was going to say, Chris, you look like you're yeah, eager. I, you no, I, 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 think, um, I think there's a lot of sharing of data. So every ticket transaction that takes place on the primary or secondary with any of the ticketing providers is shared with the team. So whether it's with Ticketmaster and our teams or StubHub and our teams, all transaction data is shared, all buyer information is shared. I think the, the edge that we have from a league standpoint is then we have all of that data from the teams shared with us centrally, which allows us to do some, some different types of analytics with that data, look across markets to see what the trends are, um, help inform pricing decisions based on all this primary and secondary data we're getting. So from our league standpoint, I think the, the sharing that takes place among the teams is something that's pretty unique. Um, but from a ticketing partner to the teams, I think it's everything is shared. Everything's shared. I mean, yeah. it, at this point, it's less about what gets shared with the teams because every, every morsel of data that we capture on a fan gets shared with the team across all, the, across all our, our touch points, primary and secondary. Um, what's, what's now important is how are the teams using that data? And whether it's Chris with Teambo or the, the NFL's group or our live analytics groups, in the last two years, teams have gotten infinitely smarter across the board, all the leagues, at how they're mining that data. And, and I think that's the, that's the big thing to note. I mean, I th our league is actually putting like a, a master database of soccer fans together. And since we're a single entity ownership, the league and the teams, we're all kind of <laughs> one entity in, in many ways. And so we have a lot of collaboration in, in building that because we're trying to build soccer fans in America. And so anyway, if we know that, hey, there was a fan of the New York Red Bull and he moves to the Bay Area to take a job at a Web 2.0 company, we could potentially market the earthquakes to him if we knew that. And if we had a good, good way to track it and understand that and things of that nature. Or know that when the Red Bull come, and that's his big team, that you could sell him you know, a ticket or a group outing. And so those are the kind of things that we're trying to do to collaborate across you know, the teams in the league. You know, and just to be clear, I'm sure this is obvious, but I'll, I'll state the obvious is, there is also a philosophical line. We, aren't, we the Chiefs, are not going to sell that to a third party. Right. right. Uh, and I think that needs to be said because at, at, when we're sharing data and we're talking all that, we're not going to go out and destroy the brand equity that we built up with our, our consumer relationships. Mm -hmm. I've just gotten sort of the 30 seconds to go sign. So thank you all for coming. Hope you've enjoyed the panel. Thank, thank you. you all, panelists, Cole, Danielle.